I'm very pleased to welcome uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Rafat Abenauer from the University of Indiana, who is going to uh, talk about the therapy uh, for elderly patients, or uh, I'll let him classify the type of approaches to therapy he's going to talk about. Maybe patients who might not be eligible uh, for transplant. So uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Abenauer, who uh, is highly specialized in myeloma, including transplant. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thanks for having me here. It's always fun to get out of Indiana in the winter. Um, so here we go. We're going to talk about how we treat myeloma patients who are elderly. So I think the first thing is um, to really, you know, we have to overcome this disease, myeloma. So to be able to overcome multiple myeloma, we need to understand sort of the biology of myeloma cells. So I think, for example, understand how these myeloma cells survive, the nature of the originating cells, the first myeloma cells in our body. Understand that not all myeloma cells within the patients are created equally, and really understand the importance of the immune system in eradicating myeloma. So first of all, I mean, you've seen this slide before. Basically what we have is that we have sort of these evil cells, the myeloma cells, and what they do is they sort of stimulate the cells that destroy the bone to make a niche for them to grow and inhibit the cells that build bone. But what's happening here inside the bone marrow is that you have this sort of vicious cycles of, uh, you know, uh, permissive environment allowing the myeloma cells to grow. And so to be able to uh, get rid of myeloma, you're not just going to kill the myeloma cells, you want to clean the neighborhood where these myeloma cells grow, inhibit or change that permissive environment to make it inhospitable for myeloma cells to grow. That will be very important. So in the old days, we just focus on what we call alkylating agents, cytotoxic agent, melphalan, our cytoxin, cyclophosphamide, to kill the evil cells, but we didn't really focus on trying to clean that neighborhood where the cells live. The other thing is that the first cells, the first cell that sort of produced myeloma, they are just sitting inside the bone marrow, and they are just, sometimes they don't multiply. They're just sitting quiet, and eventually over time, they will uh, produce a new generation of myeloma cells. These quiet cells are very hard to eradicate, and that's why we need to sort of be clever in finding a combination that will get rid of these cells, and by doing so, we probably start curing patients. And this is the slide that address this, what I call it, clonal heterogeneity, a family of myeloma cells within a patient. You know, so, you know, I don't know how many of you grew up in a Catholic family with 15 kids, but not all of them are created equal. So you have one kid that you look them in the eye, and they will, oh my gosh, I'm gonna behave, I'm gonna, you know, wash my dishes. Um, and then the other one, you have to really force them to do things. So the same thing was in our body when we have myeloma. We have cells that are very aggressive, we have cells that are very quiet, we have cells that will respond to drug A but not drug B, and the opposite. So what does that mean? If I use one drug, then I will actually get rid of just a few of these clones, but not all of it. So that's why combination therapy becoming more exciting because you're addressing the clonal heterogeneity, the different kids within the family to try to eradicate all of these cells. So that's why we're seeing better results when we use combination drugs. So how do we treat elderly patients? I mean, so what is the definition of elderly? Well, it was anybody who's older than our hero, Bob Kyle. Bob Kyle today is celebrating his 70th, 90th birthday. Bob Kyle is our hero. He's the best myeloma doctor ever to walk the earth. Was, you know, Dr. Dury is the second, but uh, <laughs> we all respect Bob Kyle. He's 90 years old and he's still going and he published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. So I think what we need to do is we treat elderly with respect. This woman is 94 year old and is still running. There's another woman that I just saw a picture of her 
she's 101 years old, and she's still running. So elderly doesn't mean that we don't treat you. We have to treat you wisely. And, but sometimes there is a problem. Is with age, things are not the same. You know, you have additional disease, you know. Guess what? When we get older, our joints get older. We get heart disease. We get kidney disease. And that can influence the choice of the treatment, the choice of the combination. We may not be able to go through very aggressive treatment, you know, high-dose chemotherapy, and in in requiring intensive treatment. So we need to address that. We need to respect the organs. We need to prevent organ damage. So, and then the other thing is that sometimes we are influenced by the insurance coverage you have, by the guidelines and things like that. And then you have the choice. You want, for example, a combination of pills. You don't want to go to the clinic and get infusion once a week. We have to respect that. So it's not really the age. It's all these other things that influence what we do and how we use combination. We sort of, um, in the International Myeloma Working Group, try to come up with some guideline to help us decide, okay, well, you're kind of frail. You're not going to be able to deal with treatment effectively. So we came up with score, depends on your, you know, these, all the things I mentioned. And you can see if you have a good score, actually you're going to, you know, and that's one third of the patients, look, you're going to do fine. Your survival at three years is 84%. But if you have a really not a good score, you can, you know, don't expect the same results because you have other things going on that can influence the treatment. So we don't use the age, we use other things that will help us address that. So when I treat a patient, you know, I have two goals. I mean, first of all, why do I treat a patient? Because they have symptoms related to the myeloma. They have the anemia, renal dysfunction, and the like. So we want to uh, uh, ameliorate all these disease-related symptoms and quickly and prevent versus organ damage, improve the quality of the life. So uh, we cannot though, approach, uh, reach the moon in one month. We have to take this one step at a time. So what are the steps? For a long time, the steps have been an induction, an intensification, and a maintenance. And along the way, you always have to include supportive care, managing the bone, managing the anemia, managing any uh, other organ-related symptoms. And we used to sort of divide the patient into transplant eligible, transplant ineligible. I think, you know, the first time you walk into the doctor office, it's very hard to sort of say, okay, this patient is transplant eligible or not. Because if you have really symptomatic myeloma, I mean, you look awful to, and uh, nobody will want to transplant you. I think the best thing is to use the best induction treatment and then three months later decide whether you should go to transplant or not. So what are the, the drugs that we use for uh, each step of the way? So in the old days, we didn't really have a whole lot. We just had, you know, drugs like uh, thalidomide. We had uh, drugs like vincristin, adriamycin. But now you can see there's tons of new combination for induction. And then we have, you know, certain improvement in what we use for transplant. And there's a lot of drugs sort on the right why are we using them just at relapse? Let's start using them early on in the course of the disease, and I'll show you some example of that. So the induction treatment now, the first time we treat the patients, include sort of, you know, drugs in three classes of drugs. So the first one is what we call proteasome inhibitor. The first drug in that group is Velcade or Bortezomib, and then there is the drug Carfilzomib or Kyprolis, and there's the pill form, exazomib or nenlaro. These are very important drugs. They really change the way we treat patients. The other classes of drugs is what we call immunomodulatory drugs. So the first in the class was thalidomide, but it does cause significant neuropathy, sort of fell off uh, the radars. We don't use it as much. Now we use Revlimid and its cousin, polyamide or pomelis. And now the new kids on the blocks are the monoclonal antibody. We have, you know, the deratumumab, and the, uh, you're going to hear more about it. I'm going to show you some example here later, and then the eltuzumab. So the choice of the induction treatment, when you have many options, is really sort of 
influenced by the underlying condition of your, uh, 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 you and, you know, your disease and, you know, what, how bad is your myeloma. All of that influence what we choose. And the good news is that by introducing all these new combinations, we're actually improving the outcome of patients. Are patients living longer and enjoying quality of life? I mean, you saw in the slide that Dr. Dury asked you this morning, I mean, there are a lot of you who are more than five years now with disease and doing fine coming to Boca Raton and enjoying a seminar. So it's, life is better today. Uh, for myeloma because we're using novel combination therapy. And the most important thing, probably because we're getting rid of myeloma. You're gonna live longer, you're gonna be happier if we get rid of myeloma. So if we achieve a complete remission, you're going to do fine. If we achieve a very good partial response, getting rid of 90% of your myeloma, you're going to do fine. So the depth of the response is important. In old days, you know, the best we could do is 50% eradication of myeloma. And guess what? Most people were not alive at five years. Now, when you achieve 100% eradication of myeloma, a lot of you are alive more than five years. That's important. So addressing clonal heterogeneity, addressing the depth of the response is very important. So let's see how we do when we use drugs to address that. So actually, this is a very old trial. We did this about 10 years ago. And 10 years ago and 15 years ago, we loved dexamethasone. So if you get myeloma, you're going to get 40 milligrams a day for four days, and we give you, because we like you, four days off, and then do it again, four days of 40 milligrams a day for, and that's called the high-dose dexamethasone. And then there, there was um, a patient that we loved and had the myeloma for a long time and then passed away, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Katz, who said, how about once a week, the low-dose dexamethasone? He was a member of the International Myeloma Foundation Board and influential, so we said, okay, we'll listen to you. So we did dexamethasone, low-dose dexamethasone, once a week. And this is the trial. Try to see, is high-dose dexamethasone with Revlimid any better than low-dose dexamethasone with Revlimid? So this is a randomized trial. And what you can see, actually, if you give high-dose dexamethasone, you're gonna get rid of more myeloma. But the problem was, look at the bottom. The high-dose dexamethasone was very toxic. We lost 5% of the patients in the first four months. So now, but if you use low-dose dexamethasone, it's 0.5%. So the standard dosing of dexamethasone now is 40 milligram once a week with Revlimid, and that's the most we use now because it's safer. And, you know, you can see that the patients actually live, more patients live down the low-dose dexamethasone at one year and two years, and when we stopped the high-dose dexamethasone, the, the two group became equal at three years. Now, the question is that, okay, what happens if you get this induction treatment? Should you go to transplant or not go to transplant? This trial did not recommend to patients to do transplant or not. It's the, you know, it's the patients and the doctor deciding what to do. So there were patients who got only four months of Revdex, high dose or low dose, and stopped. These people had a 57% three-year survival. And there is two group, one group stayed on Revdex, and one group get, went on to transplant. So I think that will give us an idea what happened if you do just Revdex uh, continuously versus Revdex and transplant. So on top here, you see the transplant group. On the bottom, you see the non-transplant group. And it looks like the three-year survival was 92%, whether you get high-dose or low-dose dex and you go to transplant, and it's about 80% if you just stay on rough dex. So what one can say is that maybe the induction followed by transplant was much better. However, actually, if you look at the age of the people who went to transplant, were 10 years younger. So that may account for the difference. So it looks like, you know, good treatment, getting rid of myeloma without transplant may be actually useful and need to be tested. And if you're frail and you get Revlimid dex compared to the old treatment, melphalan, prednisone, thalidomide, you actually do fairly well in terms of, you know, how long it takes you to relapse or how long it take, uh, you're gonna live. So, uh, you know, 
this combination is really good. The problem is, you know, was that enough? No, it wasn't a home run. So can we do better? So uh, Dr. Brian Dury led a trial through the Southwest Oncology Group comparing Revlimidex to a combination therapy that everybody is using today, which is the Velcade Revlimidex. So what is better, a two-drug regimen or a three-drug regimen? How are you going to get rid of this family of nasty myeloma cells in your body? Two drugs or three drugs? And the answer is probably the three-drug regimen. As you can see here, in terms of time to relapse, progression-free survival was superior if you use the three drugs compared to two drugs. And the overall survival is actually was better if you get three drugs versus two drugs. So how do elderly patients do? So if you look at the age more than 65, which is the majority of the patient, 43%, you can see, uh, I mean, a large number of patients in this trial, you can see that they did actually fine. You can, as an elderly patient, get three drug regimen, and you're going to live longer without myeloma, and you're going to live longer, period. So can we use other proteasome inhibitor? So this is a trial that was done a long time ago, uh, using Kyprolis with Revlimidex. And in this trial, what you can see, that the people who on the left here, who did not get a stem cell transplant, achieving significant, significant reduction in myeloma, and actually a very deep response. I mean, they're getting stringent complete remission after eight cycles at 30%. Significant improvement. So the question is, how did the patient who are older uh, a median age was 72 in that group do. And you can see that the majority of the patient after 16 cycles, 100% of them responded, and a large number of these patients achieved a significant uh, reduction in myeloma. This is called stringent complete remission. So again, we can use three drug regimens in patients who are, quote unquote, older. Is there anything, for example, can we still use the combinations in the, uh, in the relapse setting. And this is an example of a trial that look at, again, I mean, for relapse patients uh, uh, in the old days and around the world, Revdex is the combination that used. Can we add exazimab to this uh, combination and see if we can improve it? So this is the IRD, Ninlaro Revlimid Dex compared to Revlimid Dex. And what you can see here is that they actually more patients have responded when you use the three drug regimens compared to the two drug regimen, and the toxicity was about the same. No significant difference between the two arm, and this is just showing that the uh, survival is better per, uh, in this uh, combination. So I'm going to end up with this trial that I think is going to change the way um, we sort of really approach the disease. This is an interesting, very interesting trial called um, Alcyon, I think maybe. So uh, basically what it is, around the world, the easiest combination therapy to use is Velcade Malfalan Prednisone. We don't use it a lot here in, Amer in America. But around the world, that's what they use. Velcade, the pill Malfalan, the pill Prednisone. And the question is, can you improve on that standard of care? So this trial was trying to compare a group of patients who will get this combination, Velcade, uh, and prednisone, and half of the patient will get this drug, deratumumab, and the other half will, get the dr will not get that. So this is the drug, and you're going to hear more about it. It's a monoclonal antibody. It's a generated protein in the lab that will attack something on the surface of myeloma cells called CD38. And this is really the best slide, I think, that I have, because what this drug does is not just directly killing the myeloma cells, but actually sort of working on modulating that neighborhood where the myeloma cells grow and where it's permissive, allowing the myeloma cells to grow to make it inhospitable for the myeloma cells to grow. And what you see in here 
that I think just not getting, you know, getting rid of myeloma is great, but making the neighborhood cleaner is also better. So in this trial, what happened, this is the randomization. One group get the VMP for nine cycles, the other group get their atumumab, VMP, for eight, nine cycles, and then they stayed on maintenance there at Tumumab. Some people criticize this trial, say, well, I mean, clearly, if you continue to use there at Tumumab, you're going to do better, perhaps. And that's what happened here. First of all, the progression-free survival, the time it takes you to live with myeloma without relapse, without any other uh, events, was better when you use the there at Tumumab upfront with this combination compared to just the combination of VMP. And when they look at, this is a very complicated statistical slide, looking at different group of patients based on their stage and presentation, race, and, and, and things like that. And their atumumab actually improved the outcome despite your disease, your risk, your things like that. So in all subgroup, adding their atumumab is very important. And here what you can see is that there are more patients responding, the depth of the response also better. So you see the overall response rate was 91% when you use deratumumab in the induction treatment versus 74% when you don't use it. But the most important thing we're gonna hear about later is the achieving MRD negativity, minimal residual disease. And you can see that when you use dera up front, you're getting more patients who achieve minimal residual disease. That means you do very sensitive assay, you analyze a million cells or 100,000 cells and you don't find a single myeloma cells, that's called MRD negative, you're getting good results. So this is a sort of fast tour of uh, you know, available options for patients with multiple myeloma, but I, the first thing is that you need to recognize that the majority of myeloma patients are quote unquote elderly. So I think whatever we have trial-wise, we can learn from them, and, and we should use the combinations that have been shown to be effective up front. But we can personalize the care, you know, addressing really, you know, sort of patient desires, patient social, medical conditions. That's good news. We have combination that can offer that. I think we need to ongoing assessment of all side effects. So it is so important, and that you discuss these things, you discuss the side effects. I had a patient just I saw in the clinic the other day who was getting this treatment forever. She's on dexamethasone for like now five years. And um, so I just, the simple thing I said, you know, let's stand up. Can you get to the, you know, she's in a wheelchair. I was like, why are you in a wheelchair? You know, you shouldn't be in a wheelchair. Um, didn't have any, br you know, bone uh, broken in her back and things like that. So she had a horrible myopathy. The, her muscles are so weak from being on steroids forever. And I asked her, you know, did anybody ex, you know, ask you to stand up, stand on one foot, stand on your toes, stand on your heel in the last five years? And the answer was none. I would not go to that doctor. Because if they don't examine you, if they don't address your side effect, they're not serving you. Because we have options today. We shouldn't be stuck with drugs that cause you side effects. So I think we still need the clinical trials that help us address the issue of managing elderly, but addressing the issue of getting rid of myeloma. So your participation in clinical trials will be very important. So I actually, ahead of schedule, I have two minutes. I can still talk, but no, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>